Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is our third session in our utility uh, training for our uh, employees here at AFL. We've had a couple of previous topics related to the electric in industry itself, the transmission generation distribution parts of the business. And as a follow-up to the uh, previous sessions, I had uh, a couple of you say that you'd like to hear more about uh, the, the communications networks aspects of utilities, how they use networks, why they need networks, how they use the AFL products. And so we're going to talk about that some today. So that's our target uh, objective for today. For those that, that don't know me, I'm Rusty Williams. I am the uh, business development director for AFL. I uh, spent uh, 25 plus years in the utility industry doing um, telecommunications and IT work. And so trying to share some of that knowledge with the people within AFL to help understand the customer better, which is the objective. If we can understand our customers better, what their challenges are, then that should allow us to provide solutions to them that not just is something for them to buy, but an answer to a problem they've got. So if you've got a question, please interrupt me, let me know, and we will uh, make sure this is a valuable time for you guys. All right? So if I ask you up front, why would a utility need to build and own a network, what would your answers be? Why, why would they need a network? I'd like for you to shout out an answer for me. To control the network, to control the electric network. To communicate within the utility itself. That could be voice communications, uh, data communications, okay. Uh, they, could, they could have commercial aspirations and actually sell their network services to either customers or to other communications providers. That's absolutely one of the, one of the objectives for these guys. There's a, there's a hundred reasons why they need a network. And, you know, each of them go through their, their analyses of what they need, what their options are, and then decide what they want to do. Because it would be easy for them, and what many of them have done is just to let the phone company take care of it for them. The phone company, whoever that happens to be, the local telecom telephone company. So what, we, what do you think, and before we even get into this, this is your pretest. why do you think every utility doesn't just let the, the local telephone company do their telecommunications network? Why not? <clears throat> Reliability is a, is a big concern. Will, they, will the telecommunications infrastructure be working when the, when the utilities need it to work? And when is that? That's when times are the worst. It's when the hurricanes hit, it's when the ice storms hit, it's when the tornadoes go through. They've got to be able to communicate to get the, the power restored. Cost. cost. It's a difference in cost. It's not a capital cost. It'd be an operating cost as opposed to a capital cost. But if you looked at the total cost of a network, Many, many cases, and again, from my perspective, I would say most cases, it's more cost effective for the utility to build and own a network. Every case is different, and everyone has to kind of do their own thing, do their own analysis. But in, in, I would say most cases, it's cheaper, more cost effective to, to, own a net, to build and own a network. Any other thoughts about the phone company? Those are the two obvious ones. <clears throat> you never know what's going to happen with them. You got customer service issues. They could, if it's a small company, they could be bought and sold. So you don't know what you're going to get from year to year. You got security issues. In today's world, you got to worry about, you know, cyber security type issues. So if it's not your infrastructure, if it's not your infrastructure, then, um, you know, will it be secure when you need it? That, that's a good point. Okay. So there's many reasons why you would and many reasons why you wouldn't want to work with a phone company. And what we're going to talk about today is some of those options. All right, so we'll take 30, 40 minutes to go through this information, ask me a question, we'll get to the end and kind of recap and see if that makes sense on the issues we just talked about. Good enough? Okay, so this kind of gets to the point, to the question of why you need a network. Right? We've got all these generating facilities. We've got the, the big coal plants, nuclear plants, and now you're building wind farms and you're building solar farms. Guess what? You've got to, you've got to communicate with those facilities so they know when to come on, when to go off, when you know, the people have a problem, you know, a nuclear plant. 
that's a good example of a reliability issue. <clears throat> what happens in a nuclear plant when there's a problem, right? You've got to communicate, you've got to tell the public, you've got to tell the NRC. What happens when the communication systems don't work in those events? What could be a small problem all of a sudden turns into a huge problem because they can't, because they can't communicate. That's the key for nuclear plants. But then when you kind of work your way through the topics that we've talked about previously, you know, transmission lines, and you've got to control those transmission lines, switches, monitoring, all of that, that, that you're going to take the power out into the, to the uh, hinterlands. Substations, you've got to communicate to the substations. You want to know what the breakers are doing, what the switches are doing. You want to know what the voltages are so you can control the, the feeds out into the neighborhoods and then as we talked about distribution last time, we talked a little bit about smart grid. They're putting smart devices out in the distribution networks, right? whether it's switches, breakers, capacitor banks, even some new technologies, some sensors and other things that they want, they've got to get information back from those to be able to understand the health of the network and then when something's wrong to be able to take action. All right? And then you've got all the meters out there. That's, when, you, when you hear talk of smart grid, to use that term again that we used last time, what most people know of today as smart grid is smart metering, where they put these, you know, these, these intelligent meters on your home and, so, and they can read your power usage remotely. Do you guys have power meters, you know, the new smart meters? Anybody up here? <coughs> Nobody? Well, the, we're in the middle of a wave, of a five-year wave for installing smart meters. So you, you'll get not just once a month reading from your meter, but you'll get a 15-minute interval reading from your meter. So why would you need that, do you think? Why do I care how much energy I'm using every 15 minutes? <clears throat> it's several things. One is that, you know, does it make a difference at night or day, I mean midnight or noon, how much energy I'm using? Today it really doesn't because we all pay the same flat rate for the power. We pay 10 cents a kilowatt hour or whatever the rate is for your company. So it doesn't really matter. But that's going to change in the not too distant future where you're going to see time of use pricing. It's going to make a difference. So you might want to know that your dishwasher is using a lot of power and instead of running it at 8 o'clock at night right after dinner, when the power rates are high, set it to run at 2 in the morning when the rates are low. But to be able to do those kinds of things, and for you as a consumer to make those kind of decisions, you've got to have information. And for you to have information, the utility's got to have it, and for them to get the information, you've got to have a network. So that's a long way around that story to get back to the network, but to do the things that's being touted today that's going to save the world, all right, the renewable energy, you know, smart meeting, time of use, demand side management, all those things, it doesn't work if you don't have a network, period. It doesn't work. And that's where AFL comes in, the companies like us, to be able to supply those products in a cost-effective way, in a technical, technically effective way for them to meet their needs. Okay? So that was the physical electrical infrastructure, but when they pull all that data back, it's got to go somewhere. I mean, it's got to go to a data center. All, right? all you know, most utilities, I will say all, most utilities have some sort of data center, computer room, <clears throat> well, they've got their servers and they've got their storage where they put all this data. Well, guess what? That amount of data, just metering alone, just take that one aspect of metering, went from one data point per month per customer to four times 24 times 31, I'm going to do the math on that, data points per month. Thousands of data points per month instead of one. That's going to create a lot more storage issues, a lot more network issues, a lot more analytical issues for them to be able to do. And guess what? The, the technology and the networks are what's going to enable that. All right? So you're going to see, and I pulled out, anybody, that's an old picture there. I thought to see if anybody really noticed the tape drives. There's no tape drives out there anymore. But I, I mean, just to get the idea of around, going to a computer room today, a, a data center today, it is not sexy. Used to seeing all the all the tape drives spin and all the lights blink and all that. You walk in the room now, there is nothing. It's it's racks full of servers and hardware, and all it does is sit there and hum. 
There's no blinky lights. There's nothing spinning. So it's not as much fun as it used to be to at least look and see things going on. But you've got to get information back to the utilities control centers. They've got to make information in the aftermath of hurricanes and ice storms and tornadoes and the things that happen. They've got to have information to be able to make decisions to restore the power. And the networks are what brings that information. So if you're dependent on, I, I'll give the example from my experience at Southern Company, <clears throat> when uh, Hurricane Katrina came in 2006, six, it came up the Mississippi Gulf Coast. You heard all the stories of um, the devastation in New Orleans, and, and, and you saw some of the pictures from the Mississippi Gulf Coast. The one thing you didn't hear a lot of was a lot of the chaos in the state of Mississippi. Now, I attribute a lot of that to political stability and other things, and that's a conversation for another day. But the one thing that did happen is that for Mississippi Power Company, because of the way we had built and designed those networks, the communications capability stayed intact all along that, that Gulf Coast territory. I mean, you, you saw the, the flood and the surge that came in and all the devastation. And we'll talk about it in just a minute, how we did that not specifically, but generally, we were able to talk. Nobody on the Mississippi Gulf Coast had any kind of outgoing capabilities. Not AT&T, not Verizon, not T-Mobile, not Wireline, not Wireless. For three days, nobody had capabilities down there but Southern. And so that's critical to getting the power back on. You've got to be able to see the health of your system and communicate with your people and be able to do the things that you do from a computer, like in these control centers, to be able to get that power back on. And the net result, to go jump to the end of the story, in 12 days, Mississippi Power Company, who had lost 100% of their customers, had everybody back on that could take service in 12 days. And if you look around to the west just a little bit into Entergy's territory, it was weeks before that was done. And I think the, the communications and technology opportunities was a part of that, okay? <clears throat> I love this drawing, and it's a little busy, but I want to explain it to you and give you a, an analysis here to understand the difference in, in the, the similarities of the electric network and just a general uh, computer network, an information network, okay? So, you know, we've been talking about the electric infrastructure, so if you guys have been, been around and, and have been a part of those discussions, it sort of all starts at the generating plant, right? You, you take the fuel, convert it into, into energy, into electricity, and start feeding it out to the world, all right? That's where, that's where it all starts. It goes down the transmission infrastructure, out to substations, converts it, steps it down, gets it down into the distribution, part of the network in the neighborhoods that we live in, and then ultimately out to the, to the end customer. And we, if you remember, we talked about the, the power grid, the bulk power grid, and how everything's interconnected on these networks. Well, there's that connection from, you know, any given plant, pick one, you know, your friendly neighborhood utilities plant is going to be connected to that bigger grid. And so there's that connection. So in, in a kind of a simple form, kind of see how it goes from generation to, to moving it out into the, into the different areas and then to the customers. If you compare that to the, to the computer network, information network, whatever term you like, it's very similar, all right? You don't generate data per se, but you have this huge repository in the data centers that's sort of the genesis of these information networks. That's where all the data resides, that's where the, all the analytics are performed, that's where all the computing resources are, are residing. So all of that information from, without, from anywhere that we've got a data point up here in the network has got to get back to that data center, some form or fashion, somehow. So you've got all the storage farms, server farms, there's not too many mainframes left, there's a handful of them still out there, but all that computing resource is in that data center. Then you start working your way out, similar to a transmission line, you've got these wide area network circuits, these high speed circuits that are going to go from the data center out to some given area. 
could be, you know, Greenville, it could be Southeast Georgia, it could, you know, into some regional perspective, and then break it down into the, the local office, the local consumer, into the local area network. Then that connection to what we refer to on the electrical side as the bulk power grid, that connection to the internet is a high speed connection to the world. That's how we get from my network to IBM's network or my network network to GE's network or you know name it. All right, it's through these connections. So there's a there's a, a very similar configuration architecture between the two. And I'll bring that up so as we start talking about networks, having talked about the electric side, you kind of have an understanding of where we're going there. Okay, does that make sense? I've got I got some pensive looks here, so I want to make sure I haven't lost anybody. Again, it's interesting to look at and understand. That's what it's all about, is kind of draw the analogy and understand it, okay? All right, so when you look at why the utilities need networks, we talked about many of these earlier, right? There's this whole idea of generation and how we buy and sell power, how the utilities buy and sell power. You've got to have that information. It's like buying and selling oil or corn or pork bellies, right? You've got to have the information to, to know what the pricing is and to execute a trade. The generation, you remember we talked about how they decide what generating plants to run, what order to run them in. They've got to have the information in, to be uh, able to do that. Transmission control, distribution control, all the revenue data, all that billing data coming from the, the, those meters we talked about, and then all the, the normal corporate voice and data networks. That's just sort of breaking it down into the top you know, six or seven uh, applications, opportunities. That's how they fit. This is a very busy slide, right? So, the, and I've almost, you know, pulled it and I've, you know what? This really is an interesting slide. Don't try to read the words, okay? Don't try to, if, if any engineers in the room, stop looking at the, the, at the lines and, and the diagrams, but just kind of look at, this, is, this represents the entire infrastructure, the entire operations of an electric utility, right? It's, it's the, the marketing aspect, it's the operational aspect, it's the customer aspect, it's uh, the internal workings for distribution and, and transmission. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. And so one thing I want you to understand is, is that. There's a lot of activity that goes on. Second point is, it's all interconnected. Okay, you see all those lines going everywhere? It's all interconnected. But guess what? None of it works if there's not a network. All right, so just to kind of illustrate that, all these, these different types of networks, whether they're within a substation, within a building, or a wide area network, none of this stuff works if there's not a network. So does that kind of help understand, you know, the dependency? It's the, you know, I hear uh, people from time to time that, that don't understand the utility market, and this is mostly regulators in, in D.C., that don't understand why a utility needs a network. Just get a phone line. Just call a phone company. And it's much more complicated than that. There's a lot of data, a lot of critical decisions that's got to be made that takes a significant amount of network infrastructure. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, so let's talk a little bit about, okay, I decided I want a network. What are my options? A lot of options out there, right? We sell optical cable. We hope they all build fiber optic networks. But you know what? That's not always the right answer for them. And so we have to understand, and I've you know, been having this conversation with the, the utility sales guys, we've got to get in and understand those customers so that we can talk to them about their problems, not just go in and try to sell them a hammer. You know, you know if you're going to try to sell them a hammer, you're looking for you know, a nail they can beat it with. All right? So you know, understand their business, and then we can get them the right solution. So one of the first questions you've got to ask is what we've talked about already. Why don't I just go to the phone company? If I just need one circuit to t talk to a substation, that's all I need, that may be all I do. I call a local phone company and get a circuit in there. Maybe I'm doing metering like Duke is doing, and they've decided through their analysis that they're going to use Verizon's wireless network to read their meters as opposed to building their own wireless infrastructure. And they've got their reasons for doing that. I've argued with the director of telecom at Duke about it, but you know, they had their reasons for saying that's what I want to do. 
Okay, so that, that could happen, but you gotta make that decision up front. So if I'm gonna build this network, how important is it? Can I just run a fi one fiber optic cable out to a substation or to a plant? And, and then, you know, if it stays up, fine. If it doesn't, fine. Or do I need to build redundancy? Rings, alternate routes, alternate electronics, so that a single event or even multiple events doesn't interrupt that information flow. Well, the answer is going to be different depending on what it is. If I'm running, if I've got to have a connection to a nuclear plant, guess what? I've got multiple redundancies into that nuclear plant because I, have, I can never afford to be out of communication with that nuclear plant. So I've got multiple optical rings, and I even got wireless backups. I've got all sorts of things going into that nuclear plant. But if all I'm trying to do is connect a, a repeater for a radio system on a mountaintop, maybe I don't. Maybe I just run one cable up there, and if it breaks, I'll go fix it. And if I'm down a day or two, I'll just have to live with it. You gotta make that decision. Is it an optical network? Is it an electrical network? Electrical in terms of copper, in terms of you know, DS3s, T1 kind of, of speeds, or is it a wireless network? The foundational architecture or the technology for you. What do you think drives that decision? That's, my Pat? I think the primary driver is how much data have I gotta pump across that? What, what traffic, what information has got to flow across that? The more traffic, the more it's gonna to move toward optical because of the capacity characteristics. Again, if all I need to do is connect to my little wireless repeater up on the top of the mountain, I may can do it with a little short microwave link and I won't, I won't worry about it. That's all I need. Hmm. Same thing, you know, high capacity, low capacity. Uh, it, we've talked with, uh, I've talked with several customers about their distribution networks and what control systems they've got in place today. They, some of them have old systems that have been in for 15 years. Talking to these devices on the distribution network, these breakers, these uh, capacitor banks, and all they do is pull a couple of data points back and send a control command to open, close, whatever. And guess what? That 15-year-old technology that's analog, that's very slow speed or low capacity, still works. So if that's all I need to do, maybe I'm not worried about putting in an optical network today. Maybe I need it five years from now or 10 years from now, but maybe I don't today. <clears throat> There's not much analog still left out in, in the world. There's some, you still run across it occasionally, but everything's moving to a digital format and so that it's easy to feed into these systems, okay? So this is early on planning discussions, engineering type discussions that everybody's got to go through. You don't just say, hey, I want a car and go to the nearest car dealer and buy a car. Right? You do your analysis, you do your homework, what I like, what color do I want, and then you go to where you want to go for that car you want. Same thing is going to apply here. I have to think about it. Is it has it got to be redundant? Does it have to be high capacity? Does it have to be whatever? And then that leads me down a path. And that's when the sales guys from AFL get involved when they decide I want it to be optical or I'm struggling. Is it optical or is it microwave? And so we're in there then trying to explain to them, you know, the goods and the bads, give them cost data, give them all the technical characteristics, and hopefully help lead them to a, an optical decision, if that's the right thing to do for them. Okay? Okay? <clears throat> so to try to put a picture on this, you may have uh, recognized this picture. Just a simple network diagram that illustrates what we just talked about. So, you know, there may be multiple technologies within a single network. I may have a section of my network as a utility that's very important, that I want to be optical, that I want to be redundant. I touch my corporate office. I touch my nuclear plant, I touch my major substation, all of those I've got to have a lot of capacity and a lot of reliability. So I need that high speed optical backbone. But when I reach out, maybe there's an area that I don't have quite as much capacity requirements, but it's still important. Another plant kind of way off by itself, a few substations. I still want the redundancy, but I don't need the capacity. 
And then the further you reach toward the edge of the network, you see less and less of that redundancy built in. Because maybe it's just a connection to one cell tower, one radio tower, one substation that is not as important and I can justify not spending the money. Back to the discussion about Mississippi Power earlier, what we had is, is we had one of these high-speed backbone routes that went through the coast of Mississippi. It's AFL's optical cable coming from the north, from, you know, toward Hattiesburg, Mississippi, straight down to the coast, hit our hub point, which was about five miles off the coast, and then turned and went to the east toward Mobile. That's that high-speed optical. That's the major point, tie point into that network. We didn't lose both sides of that ring. We lost one side of it. That side went across through Pascagoula. We did have some structures damaged through there. But because we had that alternate path, we maintained connectivity from the outside world into the coast of Mississippi because of that backbone. But then within the co along the coast, we had these little small rings, these aggregation rings, feeder rings, that we took one and kind of went to the west, we took one and went to the east, we took one and went straight south to the corporate office, their control center, their major points. And we never lost both sides of any of those rings. Now there were some places there weren't any people. There was no one in the corporate office when the storm went through. I mean it was, all the windows were blown out and you know, there was nothing but concrete left. But in their control center, where they had a bunker, we maintained communications because we had, we, there may have been an outage over here Due to, due to wind damage, but we could still get to that point from the other side of the ring. So all of those points that were critical to Mississippi Power, we maintained connectivity to because we had this kind of architecture in the network. And then you had to reach out to the other sites, whether it's a substation, a cell tower, a, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. Some of those went down, some of them didn't, but it wasn't the critical points for the operation of the, of the network or for the electrical facilities. Even if there, this is a question for you, so think about this. So even if that's the case, I've only got a single path into a substation or to a radio tower, but it's, my, it's the private network instead of the phone company's network. Storm goes through and there's some damage. Why do you think it would still be advantageous for the, the, the utility to, to have their own network, to own those? Uh, facilities. You send your guys out to fix it in the order that makes sense to you. Because if you're the phone company, again, AT&T had nothing along the Mississippi Gulf Coast standing. They had central offices. There was nothing but a concrete slab. But there was things that we needed them to do. Well, we had a little pull, but not a lot. So if, we, if it's our microwave link, if it's our optical cable going to that substation, we could route our crews to repair it and get it back working quicker because it's important to us. So it's a combination of that operational aspect as well as the cost that drives the utilities to those networks. Okay? That good for you? Now, if you took the two previous concepts to talk about the electrical network and to talk about the communications network and put them on top of each other, this is what you got, all right? So this is, you'll have to, you may have to think about this one just a minute. But if the yellow lines here represent the electrical network. Generating plan on the left, all the way to the customers on the right. So you see substations, you see transmission lines. So if you kind of conceptually think about it that way. And then from the top down is the telecommunications infrastructure laid on top of that. So where you're trying to reach from the data centers and the control centers in those corporate offices for the utilities down through that network to reach the important locations critical to the utility. So you've got things like, hey, well, here's my wide area network. I've got to reach out into these areas. Here's my uh, substation here that I've got to worry about inside the substation. Here's my neighborhoods where I've got to read meters and, and maybe do some distribution control. All right, so you know it's not just an isolated telecommunications network, and it's away from the electrical. They're all integrated, 
I mean, these things are on the electric poles. These things are supporting the substations and the business. So that's what it looks like. So when you put a little context to it then and from what we were looking at earlier, you know, your just high-speed optical core is up here. This aggregation network to reach out into the neighborhoods. What goes on there in those uh, field area networks or neighborhood area networks? What goes on inside the home? We're not going to talk about that today. That's a whole different conversation for another day. But what about, you know, when I do want to talk to my appliances or to my thermostats or to my pool pumps? That, all right, somebody's got to worry about that network as well. And then networks within the substations, which are happening today. <clears throat> These utilities are going in and sticking in little wireless routers like you got at home into substations and connecting all these devices. And now, it's technically against the rules to do that, but there are devices that allows them to get, a, get around some of the rules. But they, everything is, is digital. Everything is Ethernet. It talks just like you want everything in your house. Right? You got laptops and you got iPads and you got... The biggest thing to me you know, for a while was printing. I'm too lazy to get up out of my easy chair, my laptop or my iPad to walk in, get on another computer that's connected to a printer I solved that problem. I got a printer that talks to my wireless network now. Right? Same thing on the substation side. They want to be able to do that, or in these offices. All right, so this, this is the, the one technical, really technical slide, and I'm not going to go through and read this line by line. But again, just to give you a feel for the level of detail that these, these utilities, with our help, have to go through before they make decisions on their networks. Okay, so if they decide that they do need this high capacity, you know, core network, then it's going to be in rings in some form or fashion. So we've got to work with them to figure out how they can route cable around their networks to be able to get rings. We're working with a utility, I was telling Kurt this morning, just outside of Knoxville. It's an electric co-op that started just buying cable from us because they wanted to buy optical cable. But they have visions of rings to touch all their substations. And so we're in there with them, trying to help them figure out. And again, this is a small co-op, but we're in there with them, trying to help them figure out which transmission lines they can get on and put in OPGW. How can they route it to get the most redundancy in their network? Where could we put electronics to provide them the most reliability for the least amount of money? That's, that's the kind of things that are going on out there now that some of you may get involved with. <clears throat> We've got to decide, is it, you know, uh, you know, Sonnet and Ethernet is just one of those optical technologies. It's just the way that the data is transmitted. Is it synchronous or non-synchronous? All right, again, that's, we're not going to get too deep into that today, but that's just one of those architectural type decisions that we're gonna, we help the utilities through. Is it microwave? Which again, for, you know, there's technical reasons to use it or not to use it. Is it some kind of point to multipoint? which we talked about earlier, the utilities use those systems and have for a long time for uh, locations where there's a lot of endpoints, but there's slow data requirements. Distribution automation, distribution SCADA is one of those. It's easy to do. But today, the utilities have got to worry more about broad broadband kind of requirements. Right? You're the same way at home, right, with your, with your internet connections. All right, so do you know what kind of uh, inter internet connection you've got at home? Do you know what speeds you're running with your interconnect internet connection at home? Anybody know? 12 meg? Yeah, hey, you know, if you think through, we've, we've evolved in our houses just like uh, the commercial side. You remember the first dial-up modems we had, if you're that old, if you're too young, then you don't remember that. But, you know, you were getting 4,800, 9,600 baud dial-up, and that was great, right? And you went to 56 kilobit circuits, and then you got DSL circuits of 250 kilobits, and it just keeps growing. And every time we, we make an advancement in the network capacity, there's something comes along to fill it up. You never, it's like, how many, how many fibers do I put in a cable when you're talking to a customer? You know, what's the answer? Well, whatever you can afford or whatever you can physically put on your structures. Because whatever you put in, you're going to need more. That's what I tell people. You know, just think of everything you can think of and double it and then round up. I mean, I mean literally, because you, you end up using those. Same thing at your house. You get a, you get a, 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 you know, a DSL line, one and a half meg, the Internet, and all of a sudden you're trying to stream movies 
Well, that DSL line is, feels like it's crawling. And I want to go to the cable company and get a 6 meg or 10 meg pipe or whatever. Same thing happens here, okay? And, and the requirements out on the edges of the network, either because of the capacity requirements, they're going to be forced to put more and more cameras up in their network for surveillance purposes, for security purposes. They're going to put cameras up in places where they have never had networks. And they've got to figure out a way to get that information back, which video is a network hog. All right. The, the, the sheer number of points, you just think about SCADA, we were talking about this point to multipoint. Companies are putting those in, and there may be a few hundred of those across an entire state today. When you get into full-blown distribution, automation, smart grid kind of things, you're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of those points. So to pull all that data back, you're going to have to have a much more robust, robust network. And that's driving to these higher speeds. But everything is moving toward Ethernet. And so the, the network uh, equipment is following that. <clears throat> but again, we talked about uh, uh, several of these, but these are a little, bit con a little bit deeper in terms of some of the things they're doing. Again, I'll kind of get to, uh, to the end of this and talk about what we, we are doing at AFL to kind of help us bring these solutions to the utility customer. Again, we do a great job of manufacturing and selling cable. We do a great job of manufacturing and selling ACA products. The other things that we do, but how we have traditionally done this, and it's not an indictment on the company because the company has been very successful, has been to go in and sell the product. Go into, somebody's going in trying to sell the cable, somebody's going in trying to sell the splicer, somebody's going in and set, trying to sell the fill in the blank. And the idea that, that I've introduced is this idea of a solution. Let's not go in and just say, can I sell you my cable? It's to ask a couple of questions. What are you doing with that cable? What kind of business issues do you have that you're trying to resolve? But what if AFL, the trusted partner for these guys, can bring a full solution to the table that includes electronics or engineering or, I mean, other things. You know, some of these broadband wireless applications we were talking about or, you know, outside plant engineering or just, you know, imagine. I mean, don't be limited by history, which, I, which is what I've been tasked to do since I didn't grow up with an AFL. Is I can go, well, what about this? And I'm not encumbered by, well, we tried that one time. But the idea is to understand the customer, bring a solution to meet their need. All right? So does that make sense? And, but it, it seems subtle, but it is really different from what AFL has done historically. And again, that's not an indictment because we have been very successful. But if we're going to continue to grow, continue to expand, continue to be that partner, then we're going to have to do things differently because people will bring these solutions to our customer base. So we did work uh, last year putting together a strategy for the market. It was really centered around the solutions approach, looking for partners that were industry leaders, not a startup necessarily, not somebody that's just looking for a channel in the utility market that's never sold in the utility market. Somebody that's there already, knows it, and is a recognized name. And through a lot of those conversations, the first partner we brought to the table is Light River. Light River Technologies. You may have seen some of the, the press about that late last year. We, we put together this marketing relationship. And, and literally, that's what that is, is we're going to work together to take each other to our utility customers looking for these opportunities to provide these solutions. All right, so you're kind of scratching, scratching your chin there and thinking about that a minute. But it, it literally, when you, you know, if, you're, if we're selling cable into a utility, they're doing something with it. Now, again, if it's a large utility, if it's, you know, Southern Company, Duke, AEP, you know, they have large staffs, and a lot of that they do themselves. But that's the exception to the rule and not the rule. So we think there's a lot of opportunity for us to provide full solutions. And Light River is the first step for that. In, in thinking through, there was a lot of parameters. I won't bore you with, with a lot of the parameters, but we wanted somebody that, one, we knew was in the market, 
that we could trust, that had similar uh, philosophies that we did, not somebody just trying to go in and sell on, you know, on price and you know, commoditized. And all. We want somebody like AFL that's selling solutions, an engineered solution so that we can maintain the, you know, the integrity of the solution technically as well as financially. All right, so that we can go in and, and, and they recognize their name. The, the one debate that we had, and if you remember, we've had a couple of uh, starts down this path. Uh, most recent one was, has been with Telabs, of you know, looking for an opportunity to, to do something like this, to provide electronics. Wasn't exactly the same, but similar. And again, not to indict anybody over that decision, but that was an example of, of, a, of a manufacturer that had no market traction. They were starting from a dead stop, and their product set didn't exactly match what the, the utility market needed. Again, I'm, I'm not casting stones at anybody that was a part of that decision. If I was there at the table, I might have made the same decision you know, in hindsight, hindsight's 50-50, according to Pat Dye, who used to coach at Auburn. Um, you know, think about that a minute. It'll hit, it'll hit later. Um, but, you know, that was just an example of somebody that wasn't in the market, didn't know it, and, and just wasn't a good match. And we wanted somebody that did know the market, but after that, uh, that opportunity with Telabs, we liked the idea of this partner having relationships with multiple manufacturers. Because one of the things we learned in our research and our strategy part of this exercise is one, there's no, no clear winner, no clear market leader. There's like four companies that have split, you know, 80, 85% of the market relatively evenly. And when you've got an embedded base, it's hard to get that embedded base out if it's an expansion or an upgrade in a network. So it's nice to have some options when you go into the utilities. If they're an Alcatel Lucent shop and they're happy with them and they've got a network upgrade, you got a 95% chance that they're gonna stick with Alcatel Lucent. And if I'm selling anybody, Telab, Cisco, name it, I'm gonna have a hard time getting any traction with that account. So one of the things that Light River brought to us was that relationship with multiple manufacturers that were the right manufacturers. Again, not, not somebody that's never been in the utility market. I mean, in those four companies that I was talking about that had 80 plus percent of the market, it is Alcatel, Cisco, CNN, and Fujitsu. So really, if you looked at all their portfolio, they have access to about 90% of the market for the, people, the, the manufacturers that are selling into the market. So that gives us a great step up when we're trying to take a solution to a customer instead of just one that may be a good one or one that may not be a good one. Okay? So, again, this wasn't something flippant or something that Rusty just dreamed up. I mean, there was a lot of effort and, and time and discussions behind all of this. I mean, the utilities told us. I mean, that was one of the things that I was, I was trying to help do is, you know, go to, go to all of my contacts in the industry and say, you know, if you had a clean slate, what would you want? I want a single point of contact. I want somebody to come give me a solution. I don't want to spend, you know, my time going to deal with 14 different manufacturers on one project. If I got somebody to come in and do that for me, that would be great. And this would get them all the way from the physical fiber plant all the way through to the, the layer two, layer three, layer three systems. All right? One stop shopping, if you like that term. So you may see some of this. Suzanne's team has worked with us to uh, do some advertisements. We've, we've made some releases. <clears throat> we've jointly been at some, um, some shows, some regional shows. Uh, you'll see a little bit more of that as time goes on. Again, it's not going to be, we're not going to spend a million dollars on an advertising campaign. It's going to be more grassroots, but you'll see more of, of the information. Maybe it's in an advertisement, maybe it's in information that's on our website. But the idea is that we do play together, and they've kind of played on our tagline of we connect. They actually already had the, the we light thing. They, they had played with that some. So we've sort of played with that a little bit in these joint advertising campaigns to kind of get to the market base. Okay, so I got through the slides. Now, what did I not answer? 
that you would like to, to ask. And either I confuse you with something or something I didn't touch on that you always wanted to know what we're afraid to ask. Yeah, from just a technological advancement, that's just where the world is going. It's one that's going from analog to digital, which we've seen, and, and the Ethernet um, platform or architecture seems to be the one that's sort of won out over the, the, the various options that were out there. But that's what you've got at home. If you're not familiar with what Ethernet is, if you've got your internet uh, at home, your um, modem or router that you've got at your house, you've got the, the big, looks like the real big phone jack or phone cable, that's Ethernet. That's what that is. And that became the standard for the local network infrastructure several years ago. And it was so easy, I mean it's really plug and play. It's easy to drop technologies in, it's easy to add, it's sort of like, <coughs> excuse me, Wi-Fi. It, you know, the technology for Wi-Fi has gotten so cheap to throw just a, a, a Wi-Fi RF chip into anything, a TV, a smartphone, it doesn't cost anything. I mean, literally, it's, it's, it is dirt cheap. Well, Ethernet's becoming the same way. It's so easy to put an Ethernet interface, and it's so universal, and it plays together so well that it's sort of become the, the de facto standard, from, and it's moving from a, kind of a local network into more of a wide area network, where we'd seen Sonic-based systems in the past, when Pat and I were, were doing carrier systems back, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, where they were putting in OC48s and, you know, you're getting two gigabit worth of capacity, two and a half gigabits worth of capacity. There's places today that you're running a 10 gigabit pipe into one place. So just the capacity requirements are driving it that way as well. Ethernet's very adaptable from a capacity perspective as well. Now, if you look you're going to see more and more Ethernet interfaces in, in a lot of things that we have, not just, you know, computers, but it, you're either going to have an Ethernet interface or a Wi-Fi interface into refrigerators, your uh, thermostats at home, your, you know, anything at home that's a major appliance, you're going to see either a Wi-Fi or some kind of Ethernet connectivity into it. Same thing in the, in the substations, though. These devices, all the meters, all the relays, all the sensors, they've all got Ethernet interfaces. And it's so easy to take that, that physical cable, Ethernet cable, which is relatively cheap, plug it in, run it back to a router, and pump it out to the, to the world. It's just a combination of cheap and easy, and you get the momentum in the market, and it just takes off. Yes, sir? Sure. So he's asking about uh, the communications techniques for uh, they, they utilize the, the, the conductors themselves. Um, actually, that is, that's an old technology from, you know, 50 years ago plus where you can insert a, a carrier, you know, a, a radio signal onto uh, an electrical wire with a, with a device and pull it off on the other end. They used it for teletype. They used it for... Um, voice communications. In fact, when I first started working with Southern Company um, in 1982 in southeast Alabama, they had an open wire carrier as a phone line to one of their remote offices. So, you know, that's kind of the genesis of it. Now, the, the utilities also use that for uh, relaying between substations. They can, they, it's the same concept. You're inserting a, an RF signal onto the conductor, but it's to for the, the relays on the two, two, two substations to be able to talk to each other. That's one of the keys that we talked about when we did the distribution discussion last time is how all this interacts, breakers and switches and all interact with each other. Well, those substations have to talk to each other and those relays can sense when things are going on and know which one needs to open up or not open up, you know, to, to kind of resolve a problem that's going on. And just over time, technologies overcome power line carrier, which is what it's typically called. It's been slow to progress. There's been multiple efforts in the last 20 years to do it for home automation, to do it for distribution automation, but it's been plagued by cost issues and it's been plagued by speed issues, the speed of the network. 
Uh, it's being used in Europe more because the houses are closer together. They don't use as many um, transformers because the load is less in each house, so they can use that technology a little bit more. But it's really being overtaken by the wireless technologies today. It really is. That is an interesting conversation to have, though, if, uh, you know, when you're sitting down over a cup of coffee or something. For those that care. <clears throat> Absolutely. And we've got to be in there early on in that process to be having those discussions because if that's the, the decisions made and the specs out, then it's too late at that point. And for a lot of companies, that's a different guy than we're used to talking to. And, you know, again, I, I appreciated the opportunity I had at Southern because I had all of the IT and telecom engineering groups together. They were in one organization. Right? So I could make the storage guys talk to the fiber guys. When the fiber guy, I mean the storage guys are going, hey, I need a storage area network and I need fiber connectivity between this office and this office. And they started going off and doing their thing. Sometimes not even knowing there was fiber already there. You make those guys talk together. I need a high-speed connection into the data center. I, you know, fill in the blank, and it's, it's going to be driven a lot by what goes on on the IT side. That's absolutely right. Other questions, comments? One thing that's... Uh, <coughs> Right, right. And that energy source will feed back into the grid. That's correct. Is that going on here, or you know, how can we avoid you know, that kind of adding? Yeah, he, he was asking about solar power that people may put on their houses and how that might impact what we've been talking about. That is a super challenge. We talked about it a little bit in our last session that, that you weren't able to come to, Stephen. But you know, one of the things that's going to be required for homeowners that do solar or geothermal or wind, I guess, if you want to stick wind up, is the local utility has to buy the excess power, the excess power. And so that creates a significant challenge in the analytics of managing that electric system. You've got to have a communications connection there, and you've got to have a control point there so that you know the data that's flowing, I mean, the uh, energy that's flowing, and you've got to be able to turn it off and on depending on what's going on in the, in the, the grid. So that is, that is a significant challenge, which not only from an electrical side is a challenge, but from a networking telecommunications perspective is a significant challenge because the utility has got to talk to that solar panel that he has no, previously he's had no need or right to do that. But to manage the grid, he's going to have to do that. And you just, could, again, continue to multiply. There's 10,000 of those in a big city, and then there's, you know, the, the, I need to talk to uh, 100,000 distribution devices, and I need to talk to, oh, by the way, streetlights are going to have smart sensors in them and can talk, and I need to talk to 2 million streetlights for Southern Company. And all of a sudden, you know, what used to be, uh, you know, a few thousand metering points has turned into hundreds of thousands of data points that we've got to communicate to and manage the data of. Right, right. So, so his question was, does the, if you had a solar panel, do you just sell all that to the, to the local utility and then buy back from them, or do you use it locally and then sell the excess? And, and the latter is true. You, 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 know, you have to redo your electrical system in your house if you do that. It's not the same as it is today. But basically, you use every bit of power you can from your solar panel first in your house. And if there's excess left, then it will flow back onto the grid. Or if it's not enough, which is the case most of the time in this part of the world, then you're buying the remainder that you need from the local utility. Yeah, there's not many places. I mean, it, it would take a lot of solar panels with today's technology 
especially in this part of the world, to be able to do that. And you're not going to you're not going to want to do that from a cost perspective, even if you're if you live in a neighborhood that will allow that. Yeah. Good question, though. That's just more more need for networks and more dependence on networks for the utilities to do that kind of stuff. And our stuff is right in the middle of it. That was the point I was trying to make as we wrap up here, is the things that AFL manufactures and sells into, these, into the utilities is critical to make that happen. And we need to understand that and be able to communicate with the utilities about that. So any chance you have to do industry research and better understand what's going on, then I encourage you to do that. All right, thank you guys for being here today. Enjoyed you being part of the session. And I will see you down the road at the next session.